Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Van Dorp. I am the Budget Division Director with the Department of Local Government Finance. Would like to welcome you to the uh, the first budget webinar of the of the season. Uh, over the next 60 minutes, we're going to cover uh, a concept that is very timely of the of circuit breakers. Before we get into it, we'll before we get into it, let me uh, start by saying this is an extremely complicated topic. Over the course of the next 60 minutes, we're going to start with some pretty uh, basic information, but by the time we're at the end, we're going to be getting into the heart of what Circuit Breaker is and why it is we're going to take an hour to talk about it this, why it is we're going to take an hour to talk about it this afternoon. As uh, Jenny referenced, we're going to record the presentation and be able to post it. So in addition to having the slides, we are moving towards trying to develop a library of various budget related topics that you'll be able to refer to, not just with the slides, but with a, a, a sort of a guided tour over the over the information. Now, this is very similar to the presentation that we delivered last year right around the same time, but with assistance from the DLGF field staff, specifically Ryan Burke, I think this version is a lot is significantly improved over last year. I think some of the examples have been tweaked so that they are more realistic to what it is that we'd be representing. The other part that I remember about giving this presentation last year was that I found myself running out of time towards the end. So let's go ahead and dive right in. See, so we can't make it through all 60 slides in the next uh, over the over the next hour. So the uh, the goal of the presentation today is going to be to answer these three questions. What are circuit? What are property tax caps? What is the circuit breaker? What is it that we mean when we refer to those those specific topics? Number two, we're going to take a look at how circuit breaker loss is calculated at a tax bill, how it is presented at the taxing district level, and then how it's ultimately presented to you at the taxing unit level. Number three, we're going to take a look at the timetable that's associated with circuit breaker, how the department puts together an estimate each July, how units incorporate the their estimated circuit breaker throughout their budgeting process, and then how the actual circuit breaker is calculated and presented nine months later in the in the following year in the, in the following year. To do that, we're going to sort of set we can break the presentation into four distinct sections. But we're going to start off by doing a, just an overview of the budget order. There's some definitions we just need to there's some definitions that we need to start with. But from there, we will pivot into doing sort of a tax bill 101. We're going to take a look at an individual tax bill and what each line represents and how that has an implication from a circuit breaker perspective. Section three, we're going to take a look at circuit breakers as we involve those in the budget. And then in section four, we've got some frequently asked questions that we're going to reference, just sort of staged questions that help to sort of clarify some of the points that we look at throughout the rest of the presentation. So let's dive right in and taking a look at the budget order. There are two very specific definitions that we need to start off with. The first of which is a taxing unit. So what is a taxing unit? Now, the short answer is we would say that statute would define that as a political subdivision with the power to impose taxes. The, another way of looking at that is if you're listening to this presentation, there's a 99% chance that you're affiliated with a taxing unit. So we're talking about counties, townships, cities and towns, school corporations, libraries, special districts like fire districts or airports or transportation authority or waste management districts. When we think about who we work for or who is elected, uh, who, who's elected you in the office, you represent a taxing unit. Now, each year, the taxing units around the state go through the process of adopting a budget and the department goes through the process of certifying that unit's uh, annual budget uh, tax rate and levy. Now, depending on a number of factors, the department may have a deadline of certifying your your budget order by either December 31st or January 15th. If you haven't seen your budget order, there's a link on the page that will take you to the department's website. Under each county, we will we post the we post the budget orders inside each county. You can find your specific uh, budget order information. Now. On the budget order, the information is really broken into four distinct sections. The certified appropriation, and so what that what that represents is your spending authority for a given fund for a given year. The next column we'll see is the certified net assessed value. That's your tax base, the total value of all 
taxable real and personal property in a given area. Your property tax levy, that's the amount of new property taxes that you are bringing in during the upcoming budget cycle. And then the, 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 the fourth one, and what's really gonna become the star of our show today, is the certified property tax rate. Now using a combination of your tax base, your net assessed value, and your uh, certified property tax levy, we can figure out what rate everyone in that area will need to pay in order to generate that amount of property taxes. But if those are the words, let's take a look at a picture of this one. So on the screen, we're looking at an excerpt from the 2021 budget order for the town of Plainfield in Hendricks County. The budget order is much longer for this particular taxing unit, but this excerpt can cover a lot of what we want to take a look at. So for 2021, Plainfield has a certified budget of 14.6 million. Yeah, that's the intersection of what they've advertised, what they've adopted, and what they've reported that they can afford in the in the upcoming year. The tax base for Plainfield is $2.5 billion. That's how much, that's the assessed value that's going to be uh, that Plainfield will be taxing in the in the upcoming cycle. The 4.1 million of the certified levy, that's the new property taxes that they expect to generate during the course of the year. That is one of the values that is used to determine what the what the town can afford. That four that 4.1 million helps to fund that certified budget of 14 million. But we can see there are other things that are included in it, but the new property taxes is one of the represent almost a third of how they're going to fund their budget. The last piece is that certified tax rate. So in order to generate $4.1 million against a $2.5 billion tax base, what we know is that the, the that the taxing unit will have to charge 16 or 0.1643 cents per $100 of assessed valuation to generate that property tax levy. So those are the four key pieces of the budget order. And we're going to see how this will play out in a in a couple of different over the next few slides. Now, like I said, this is an only an excerpt of the Plainfield of the Plainfield budget. If we looked at all of the funds that the department certified, the total tax rate for Plainfield for the upcoming year is that rate down at the bottom of 0.8154. Now, if that is a taxing unit, we need to define what a taxing district is and in essence, a taxing district is just an organizational structure. It's a way to organize the tax rates that will ultimately appear on the tax bill. A taxing district is a geographic area composed of multiple unique taxing units. If you think about where you live, that taxing district would represent the county that you're in, the township that you're in, the school corporation. If you are in a city or town, if you're in a fire district, where all of those taxing units overlap, that is the taxing district. So if we look on the maps, we won't see taxing district boundaries. But for the purposes of sending out tax bills, collecting tax revenue, we use the term taxing district as, a, as an organizational structure. Now, when we start talking about the bills themselves, we will see that we're gonna reference a taxing district rate, and that's where it's important to know that the taxing district rate is just made up of all the units where that all the overlapping units where a particular parcel exists. As a fun caveat, a taxing unit may span multiple taxing districts, and we'll see that in an example in Plainfield here on the next slide. But the parcel, each parcel, every parcel in the state only exists in a single taxing district. Right. Let's take a look at that sort of represented. Um, let, let's take a look at that from a different perspective. So the town of Plainfield who has a current rate of 0154 in the upcoming cycle, exists in taxing districts 11, 12, 27, and 29 in Hendricks County. In each taxing district, their total rate of 0154 contributes to the overall taxing district rate for that, for that taxing district. So taxing district 12 that's um, squared off in green there, of the two dollars or the 2.091.8154 is made up of the of the town of Plainfield's taxing rate. Another way of looking at it is if taxing district 12 has a total rate of 2.091, we can see how the Hendricks County, 
the Guilford Township, Town of Plainfield, Plainfield Community School Corporation, and the Plainfield Guilford Township Public Library all sum together to create that rate. So what will appear on the tax bill is 2.091. The 2.091 can be traced back to each taxing unit's total tax rate for the upcoming year. So let's pivot there from the definitions to, to starting to get into how, in addition to the taxing district rate, the other values that go together to create a tax bill. In the upcoming year, in 2021, the state of Indiana is going to send, or the various counties in the state of Indiana are going to send out 4 million plus tax bills that are going to generate $8.6 billion worth of property taxes that are going to flow into local government. And while today's presentation is largely focused on the circuit breaker, there, there are three different things that we are covering that are worthy of their own hour long presentations. The concept of the property tax cycle is worth its own presentation. A deeper dive than we are going to go into for the tax bill is worth its own presentation. And just going through some of the terms that I'm some of the terms that I'm using deserves their own presentation. The links on the page will take you to parts on will take you to the department's website where you can find additional information, but know that there's always more that we can sort of present on. And just because we're not presenting on it today doesn't mean there's more. There isn't more information available to us. So with today's focus being on circuit breaker, we're going to touch on some of these topics, but there's more information available if you if um, if you want to go deeper into a particular particular section. What we're looking at on the screen is an excerpt from the state form 53569. That is the the, the template that we that all tax bills are are meeting. In this first section, we're really going to focus on working our way line by line from section from row 1A down to row down to row three. Okay. And so this is just a this is just a mock up, but we want to take a look at how the tax bill is functioning so that we can really examine where circuit breaker is coming from and how that's ultimately going to end up impacting you. Now, similar to a couple slides ago where we said that there is significantly more information than what's being presented on this slide. We're going to talk about gross assessed value for for a moment here, but I need to acknowledge that the department has a division that's dedicated to assisting local officials with calculating the gross assessed value. What I've taken is 60 minutes of one of their presentations and sort of distilled it down to a single slide. So know that there's a lot more information on this slide than what we are currently presenting. But for the purposes of today's presentation on Circuit Breaker, we're going to we're going to pretend like the gross assessed value can be described in just in, in three bullets. But the the first bullet is these gross assessed values are determined by your local assessing official and they're calculated annually. So while the values ultimately get reported to the department and we use them, I want to reference that the source material, the original values are coming from local assessing officials. Number two, the property, the, the gross assessed value there is designed to represent the market value in use of a, of a of a piece of land and its improvements. Number three, when we're talking about the gross assessed value, we're talking about approximating, approximating that market value as it compares to similar properties in an area. So one house in the, uh, a, if two identical houses are built, one near Lake Michigan, one near the Ohio River, when calculating the gross assessed value, for the one near Lake Michigan, they'd be comparing that house to the other properties in that area. And when uh, calculating the gross assessed value for the for what is the same property in, near the Ohio River, they would be comparing it to other properties in that uh, in and around that the, that same area. So when we're calculating the gross, we know that there is a a significant local component local component in that calculation. Now, when we think about our tax bills, or when we think about the gross assessed value, we generally consider the total value of the property. But in truth, the 
AV can be broken into distinct property groups. And this will be the first of three times we're going to reference this list of six property property groups. First time we're just introducing it as a topic because of where it extends on the tech on the on the tax bill. But the next two times that we see this info, we'll do a deeper dive into why this is relevant to the the, the calculation and the discussion of of circuit breaker. OK, so we started with the gross assessed value and from there we need to talk about how exemptions and deductions impact the value, the, the actual taxable value of the property. With an exemption, there are certain types of property or certain types of taxpayers that are not taxable. And so while the local assessing official is calculating how much the property is worth, what exemptions and deductions is to do are reduce the amount that they reduce the amount of taxable AV that's associated with the parcel. Gross AV tells us what it's worth. Exemptions and deductions reduce how much an individual, how much taxable property is tied to an individual property. So with exemptions, there are certain types of property or taxpayers that are not taxable. With a, reduc with a deduction, we're looking at certain types of uh, assessed value where a taxpayer is um, where a taxpayer pays less than what the what the gross about gross assessed value would be. Uh, so while the tax bill begins with the gross, you end up we end up calculating the individual's tax liability based on that net assessed value. And so line two is the total value of the gross. Line two A is looking at a, a listing of all the exemptions and the deductions. And then line three takes us to that net assessed value of a property. Another way of looking at it, we've got three examples here. We've got your traditional homestead property. We've got a, a, a church and we've got a government owned property in the same in the same taxing district. Most homesteads qualify for a $45,000 reduction. We've got a supplemental homestead deduction for $19,250. And we've got a mortgage deduction of 3,000. So while the home's gross assessed value was 100,000, the net assessed value for the for that homestead property has been reduced down to $32,750. Now, in the example of the church, it was originally valued locally at 100,000, but it qualified for a religious a religious exemption of 100,000. So the net assessed value. For that particular property is is zero. The government owned property, same idea, started with a gross assessed value of 100,000. It qualified for the government exemption and so its uh, net assessed value uh, was ultimately reduced down to zero. And so the exemption deductions allow us to reduce the property tax liability without altering how we calculate and value property around the state. In each one of these examples, Locally, it was assessed that the value that when it when a property was built, how it was built, the materials that were used were calculated at 100,000. But through the series of exemptions and deductions, we can the legislature can control how much you'll pay in taxes based on what it is that you own. Okay. So from there, we calculating the gross liability. We've determined what the net assessed value is, and what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that by the taxing district rate. But as we discussed earlier, whether we look at it as multiply the sort of the top table there of multiplying the net AV times the taxing district rate, another way to present that would be multiplying the net AV times the county rate, times the school rate, times the township rate. So we can see how summing those tax rates together allow us to present a much more sort of con uh, condensed version, a much more concise version on the on the tax bill. So going back to what our our tax bill template looks like, we've looked at how the gross assessed value is represented in 1A, 1B, and 1C, and we can sum those together. If a property qualifies for any exemptions and deductions, we can take that out of 2A to ultimately arrive at the net assessed value that we're seeing on line C, sorry, on line three. On line 3A, we've, uh, we, we apply the local taxing district rate from there, we can calculate what the gross liability is. All right. So if that's how we calculate the gross liability, 
how do we go from the gross to the net? And so in this next section, we're really going to focus on from row 4, 4A, 4B, 4C. We're going to look at how various property tax credits lower the gross liability until we arrive at the net. And we are 25 minutes into the presentation, and this will be the first time that we really start looking at circuit breaker getting involved in, the, in our calculation. And so where exemptions and reductions sorry, where exemptions and deductions reduce the amount of taxable assessed value. When we start talking about credits, we're talking about reducing the gross tax liability directly. So on your tax bill, there are three specific types of credits that are applied and they're applied in this order. Local income tax for property tax relief, then is the circuit breaker, and then is the over 65 circuit breaker. So well, let's take a look at those individually. And so when we talk about income tax or local income tax or LIT, the first thing that generally comes to mind are certified shares or public safety or economic development. One of the other options that a county can choose to adopt is local income tax for property tax relief. Last year, there were 60 counties that opted into this configuration and they had pledged $427 million, or their combined income tax rates generated $427 million that were applied as credits to property tax bills. Now, when adopting a local income tax for property tax relief, the first thing that a county will do is uh, determine what rate they want to charge the taxpayers. The second thing that they need to decide is who will they apply that relief toward? And so this is the second time we've looked at a picture that has talked about these, um, these, AV, these AV times. Once a county has decided they want to offer to property tax relief, they can then offer that relief to any combination, any one or any combination of the, of the groups that are presented on this page. And so, they can take their total and say that everybody is going to benefit from the property tax relief or they can uh, focus the relief on homestead properties or uh, agricultural properties or non-residential real estate or commercial properties. They can separate the amount that they're generating and then target the relief to where they want that relief to go. And so as you are looking at your tax bill, even if you are in one of those 60 counties last year that was offering property tax relief, the follow up question is, who are they offering that property tax relief to? If the county has opted to offer to the to a type of property that you own, you'll see on your property tax bill how much relief you are getting. Now, how that sort of manifests in the practice would be your gross liability could show up as 100. You would qualify for $20 of credits, which means that you would end up paying 80 the credit would be applied to your bill. And so when the county auditor starts to distribute its settlement funds, you still get the same amount of money that you were expecting, but the taxpayer themselves um, saw the benefit of the, of, the, of the credit being applied to their tax bill. So the second, the second type of credit that is applied to the bill is not something you're going to find in statute, but this is where we start to get into the idea of what is the circuit breaker? What is the circuit breaker crap? What is the circuit breaker credit? Now, as in the Indiana Constitution, so not in code, but in the Constitution, about a decade ago, the General Assembly created a property tax cap, a circuit breaker cap. What that's designed to do is to identify the maximum tax bill any individual can pay in any given year. Once a tax bill exceeds that cap, a credit is applied for the difference. So we'll take a look at how the calculation is, is, is actually performed. But if my circuit breaker cap is $100 and my actual tax bill comes in at 130, my bill will be credited $30. I will only pay my maximum. And so that's what when we're talking about circuit breakers, that's what we're talking about. The maximum tax bill, the credit represents the difference between what the tax bill could have been and what they'll ultimately end up paying. 
And so now here's the third time we're going to start taking a look at those different types of property. For a homestead property or a, for a property that's classified as a homestead, their circuit breaker cap is calculated at 1% of the gross assessed value. For residential property, for long-term care property, for ag, for ag land, it's 2% of the gross assessed value. And for commercial or non-residential real property or personal property, it's 3% of the gross assessed value. Another way of looking at it is when we're trying to calculate the cap on any individual property, we don't need to know exemptions or deductions. We don't need to know the tax rate. We don't need to know the gross liability. When calculating the cap, all we need is the gross assessed value. And so what we're looking at on the screen are three distinct properties, each with the same gross assessed value. In that second column, we're looking at a homestead, third column piece of uh, ag land, and in, in the Third column, in the fourth column, we're looking at a, a commercial property. Gross AV times the 1%, ag land times the, sorry, the gross AV of the ag land times the 2%, the gross AV of the commercial property times 3%. We know going into the tax bill calculation that in this particular example, the homestead property's tax bill cannot exceed 100,000. The ag lands, based on their gross assessed value, their property tax cap is gonna be 2,000 and the commercial property going into the calculation before we've done anything else, that their maximum tax bill is going to be 300,000. So if that's how we calculate the cap, in the next three slides, we're going to look at examples of how we calculate the circuit breaker credit. And so we can see in examples one, two, and three, we're still looking at homestead property. So all three of these are going to fall into that same 1% bucket. Now, in each case, we've used the same amount of exemptions and deductions. What we've changed throughout, it gets into the row of the tax rate. In example one, we're looking at a tax rate of 1.5. In example two, we're looking at a total taxing district rate of 3.5. And in our third example, we've taken the rate all the way up to four and a half. So as we, as we covered, we take the net assessed value times the tax rate in example one, and we can see that the gross liability is $491. The property tax gap, or 1% of the gross AV in the example, is 1,000. And since the gross liability is less than the property tax cap, there is no circuit breaker credit applied to this first bill. The person will come in and pay $491. Now, in example two, we can see that with a higher tax rate comes a higher gross liability. In this second example, the gross liability is up to $1,146. But with a property tax cap of a thousand, the individual will qualify for a hundred and forty six dollar credit. In the third example, a even higher tax rates now push the gross liability to fourteen hundred and seventy four dollars, but the property tax cap is still a thousand. In this third example, the individual will benefit from a four hundred and seventy four dollar four hundred and forty four hundred and seventy four dollar circuit breaker credit. We'll go through examples on, on of the two and the three here a little bit more quickly. Now, in the for this for examples four, five, and six, we're looking at ag land, which falls into that two percent circuit breaker. And so we can use the gross assessed value to figure out that in all of these properties, they're going to have the same property tax cap of two thousand dollars. Now, as the rate starts to increase, we can see that the gross liability is increasing. And as we compare the gross liability to the property tax cap, we can see what amount of tax credit each one of these properties is going to qualify for. In example four, gross liability is less than the cap, so there are no credits. In example five, the this particular taxpayer is going to qualify for $1,500 of credits. And in example six, for this one property, the taxpayer is going to benefit from $2,500 worth of, worth of credits. And then Probably the most, most in, in our third example, we're looking at a very similar example from the 3% bucket. In example seven, gross liability is less than the cap, so there are no credits. In example eight, 500, and in example nine, we're looking at $1,500 of credit. So, in order to figure out how much circuit breaker credits are going to be applied to an individual tax bill, we need as much information as we can possibly get. The gross AV can be used to calculate the cap, but we need to be able to see 
the gross liability compared to the cap to figure out how much circuit breaker loss there will be on any given property. Now, we're going to come back to circuit breaker in a moment, but we need to at least briefly talk about this third type of credit. Now, the over 65 circuit breaker credit is only applicable to certain individuals that meet age, income, assessed value, and residency requirements. If an individual qualifies their entire tax bill after we factored in any changes to the assessed value, after we factored in any of the changes to the tax rate, to the property tax, the income tax, property tax credits, or even the circuit breaker, if an individual's tax bill still went up by more than 2%, that qualifying individual is, will see this other type of circuit breaker take over. So if they, their tax bill can't increase by more than 2%, any additional increase that we're looking at would be, would be treated as, as, as if it were a credit to their tax bill. Okay, so we started off with gross liability. We've taken a look at the three types of credits that are applied to it so that we can ultimately arrive at our net tax bill. But let's spend a little bit more time talking about circuit breaker or more specifically, why it's the budget division that's presenting on on circuit breaker, why this why this is so important to us. So the, the folks that are listening to this are find themselves in a pretty unique situation as both representatives from taxing units and also as taxpayers. With for, if we if we if we look at circuit breaker from a taxpayer's perspective, the circuit breaker creates a maximum tax liability. If the gross liability exceeds that cap, a credit is applied. So as a taxpayer, they can consider the circuit breaker credit as a savings, money that they didn't have to pay. On the other side of the coin, from a taxing unit's perspective, the circuit breaker represents a portion of the levy that cannot be collected. It was never, they, they when the tax bill came out, while the bill may have shown one amount, that circuit breaker credit is a part of the bill that you were expecting to collect, but the taxpayer never had to pay. So when we talk about circuit breaker from a taxing unit perspective, circuit breaker represents a loss in revenue. And so let's go back to that example where we were looking at before of example number three, where for that one property, what a unit thought it was going to collect when the bills went out was 1,474. What the taxpayer actually paid was 1,000. And so for this one single property, there was a $474 credit benefit to the taxpayer savings to the taxpayer, while simultaneously there was a $474 loss to the unit and units that thought they were going to receive that money during their during their settlement. And so what happens if there's 10 parcels that meet this criteria or 100 parcels or 1000 parcels or 10,000? We can see how the circuit breaker losses start to rack up pretty quickly. 474 may be enough. You may be in a position where you can handle that type of revenue reduction. 4700, 47,000, 474,000. We can, it's important that we are knowing that circuit breaker is a reality in many parts of the state of Indiana. It's important that we're considering what part of our certified levy will never be collected or distributed to its underlying units. So what we're looking at here is an excerpt from the revised form 4B that was debuted last year. And this is worthy of its own 60 minute presentation where we can see that when the department changed the layout of the Form 4B, we one of the most significant changes we made was how we presented the estimated circuit breaker impact. On the new version of the Form 4B, it's presented as a negative amount. While line 11 is showing us how much we think the property tax levy is going to be, for this particular example, the unit thought it was going to lose 233000 out of an estimated $818,000 worth of property taxes they were going to use to fund their budget. Okay. So we know that circuit breaker is a reality and so that 
when working through the budgeting process, as you are estimating your future expenses, as you are reviewing the additional, the amount of property taxes you're expecting to collect or the types of miscellaneous revenue that you'll be using to fund your budget. It's also important that there's an estimation of what your circuit breaker profile is going to be. Now, per statute and to assist with this process, on or before July 15th, the department will release its circuit breaker estimates for every unit in the state of Indiana. And while units are required to consider the impact of circuit breaker, you're not required to use the department's estimates if locally within your organization or through your financial advisors or through your association, you come up with a an addition with a more with an estimate that you would prefer to use. You absolutely can use that estimate. The goal here is that we try to make it as realistic or as close to accurate as possible. Now, now when the department is putting together its estimates, and so we're going to release these here in the next in the next three months, we're going to factor in a lot of different we're, we're going to reach to as many factors as we can to make this determination. What your circuit breaker has historically been. We're going to take a look at the results of your pre-budget survey. We'll factor in the max levy growth quotient so that we can try to come up with an estimate of what we think your circuit breaker is going to be. What we're looking at the picture on the screen there is how that information is presented. In July, when we're posting this report, we can't tell how many funds you're going to levy against, right? One fund, five fund, 10 funds. We are so early in the process that we, we can't answer that question. So instead, we present circuit breakers at the max levy type. And so what we're looking at here is for Bartholomew County, whether they are ultimately going to adopt one fund or 10 fund or 50 funds, we think that based on their historical configuration, we think there's going to be a mil one million four hundred thousand dollars worth of circuit breaker loss that they should be considering. Uh, for Clay Township, whether it's one fund, five funds, ten funds, we think that their civil funds together are going to see seven hundred and twenty dollars worth of losses. Clifty Township historically has not had any circuit breaker loss, so that's what we're going to be estimating. And then for Columbus Township, same idea. We are estimating the circuit breaker loss associated with their civil funds at one hundred and twelve and their township fire funds at 439. When the department releases its estimates, we don't know what funds you're gonna have, but we can put together an estimate for the amount of loss you're gonna have or that you'll be spreading across all of your funds. Now, flash forward nine months later, all right? So we've released the estimates the unit has either used the DLGF estimates or has used locally calculated circuit breaker estimates as they were putting together their budgets. In April, or part of the reason why this presentation is being given when it is, is we are ready, we are close to being ready to release your actual circuit breaker reports for the for the for the 20 pay 21 uh, budgeting cycle. Now, unlike the estimates that we released nine months ago we know what funds you certified we have the actual amounts of circuit breaker by funds once those reports are available we will post them under this county specific information one for one for each county the template that we'll release will look a lot more like this one and so in adams county we can see each we can see each fund that we certified a levy for we can take a look at your over 65 circuit breaker we can take a look at the circuit breaker that was based on the 1% or the 2% or the 3% total. We can sum those two together to represent the total circuit breaker losses. So in this case, uh, Adams County in this example was looking at a quarter million dollars worth of uh, total circuit breaker losses. And we can present this post circuit breaker, um, post circuit breaker levy if what we ultimately certified or what we originally certified was the certified levy of 10,378,000. When we factor what we actually build on and when we subtract out the amount of circuit breaker that would be lost, we can create a report that looks like this. So at the fund level, how much circuit breaker or how much property tax is expected to be collected. We released this ad adjusted report and so in July, we released a report that showed the estimated totals. 
And then nine months later, we're releasing a report that looks like this that shows you each fund that we certified and the amount of circuit breaker loss that would be associated with those specific types of funds. Which brings us to the point here. Now, once the new circuit breakers come out, the department doesn't release an amended budget order. But what we are encouraging all units to do, and I can't quite stress this enough, what we're encouraging you to do is to take a moment to reconcile the estimates that you use to build your budget to the actual circuit breakers that came out at the fund level. And we'll find that everybody's going to fall into one of three distinct scenarios. Scenario one, you thought the circuit breaker would be worse. Right? You thought the circuit breaker would be a thousand dollars, but in truth, it only came in, it the circuit breaker came out to 800. So what does that mean? One, it means your budget is fundable. It means that the amount of property taxes that we use to build your budget will be covered, should be covered by the, or should not be impacted by the, the circuit breaker amount. In fact, it's almost as if you were going to receive more money than you thought you were going to, right? You're, we thought circuit breaker was going to cost us more than it did, and so this is like finding an additional revenue source. So whether a unit goes through the process of doing an additional appropriation or starts the process of considering some new spending priorities or they just leave the money in the in the fund, there's a chance that your operating balance is going to be higher than you thought it was going to be. I hope that everybody finds themselves in that position. Now, scenario two where the circuit breaker estimate is you estimated it perfectly. You thought it was going to be a thousand and it came in at a thousand. Your estimates were spot on. You were able to see the future. You were able to know how much revenue you were going to, you were not going to be able to collect. It means that your budget is still fundable. You're going to get the amount of property taxes you thought you were going to. This is still a very good position to be in. The third one, we've got it highlighted in red. So this is this is where I want to make sure we're drawing as much attention to as possible. In scenario three, you didn't think there'd be any circuit breaker at all. And in fact, it came in at $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, a million. It means that you could find yourself in a position where you built a budget assuming you'd get one amount, but you are actually going to receive less. Now, in those two cases, we could run the risk of your one, your budget not being fundable, or two, we could be taking a look at, you could potentially be spending down your cash balances. Let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. This is that representation of the first example that we were looking at. In this top box, we're looking at row 12 is an excerpt from the 4B, where when this unit for this fund was putting together the budget, they thought they would see $233,000 worth of circuit breaker losses. When the actual circuit breaker report comes out, we can see that the actual circuit breaker losses were only 202,000, which means that they thought circuit breaker was gonna be worse than it was. This, in this particular example, we're looking at the uh, sort of a net impact of a potential collection of an additional $31,000 of revenue. In this case, we started off with a $100,000 operating balance, and so at the end of the year, if nothing else changes and all the other estimates come in, where we thought you were going to end with a cash balance of $100,000, you could end up with a cash balance of $131,000. Like I said, this is best case scenario. On the other side of the coin, in this example that we've got staged, we pretended as if still estimated there would be $233,000 worth of circuit breaker impact, but in truth, the circuit breaker impact was 250,000. And so uh, row 18 showed that we had, an, we we're anticipating an operating balance of 100,000, but there are more losses to revenue than were originally worked into the budget. In order to maintain the same spending levels, there is a chance that this unit is going to start to burn down their cash balance. And so they're not gonna end with 100,000 they were expecting. They're gonna find themselves with 84,000, right? wrong what we're the the recommendation or the request to do this reconciliation is to know which which uh, scenario you're going to find yourself in in this third example this is the one that probably worries the department the most 
in this example, there was no operating balance. The unit sought to uh, sought out a budget that made every dollar that they had available. But now that sixteen thousand uh, dollar difference between what the circuit breaker was estimated at versus what the circuit breaker actually came in at is a chance to spend that fund not just not just to reduce the operating balance, but to actually spend it into the red. When the circuit breaker reports come out, we can when the circuit breaker reports are available, the actual circuit breaker reports are available. Going through this reconciliation at the fund level is uh, designed to help you to figure out which one of these one of these which one of these three groups you would find yourself in. Now, the department is going to or the DLGF will uh, create a report that will summarize this info. We'll take a look at what the DLGF estimated originally. We'll take a look at each one of your funds uh, and the estimate that was actually worked into the budget. And then we'll sort of merge that with a report that shows the actual circuit breaker. We'll include the operating balance so that you can, your that information will be provided to your field reps. And if you reach out to them, they can help you to discuss the position that you find yourself in for the as you are going into sort of next year's budgeting cycle. Okay. So we are into the home stretch. At this point we switched sort of the fourth section of the of the presentation. That's a couple frequently asked questions, but we're going to be able to go through these pretty quickly. And so one of the questions that we get pretty regularly as it relates to circuit breaker is in this scenario, I have the exact same tax rate that I had last year. So why am I seeing more circuit breaker loss than I saw in the prior year? And this gets into while you are adopting your budgets, the circuit breaker is calculated using that taxing district rate. And so while your rate may have stayed sta stay the same, we need to take a look at all the various taxing district rates that you're associated with. Someone, another unit's increase may be what's driving the increase in circuit breaker losses. And so when the department releases the budget order, taking a look at the taxing districts that you're affiliated with is a way to get a sense of, even if your rate changed, what impact did we see on the total taxing district rate? And did that rate change, was that rate change significant enough that it's going to lead to a change or a potential increase in the amount of circuit breaker that you'll be seeing in the upcoming year? Question number two is one that we kind of touched on, but I wanted to put a little bit of a sharper point onto it. And that's how we handle multi-use parcels. So three different times during the course of the presentation, we talked about different types of AV. And so in question 2A, this is a taxpayer who has a combination of real retail space and residential space on the, on the same parcel. And question 2B is taking a look at an individual who has both uh, their, their homestead and farmland on the, on the same parcel. In those cases, how do we calculate our circuit breaker cap? This is part of the reason why lines 1A, 1B, and 1C are separated the way that they are. So for a multi-use parcel like the one that's sampled here, we've got 180,000 worth of gross assessed value separated as 100,000 in the 1% bucket, 50,000 in the 2% bucket, and 30,000 in the 3% bucket. To calculate what the circuit breaker cap would be for this, for a parcel that's configured this way, we multiply 1A times 1%, two, 1B times 2%, 1C times 3%. So the circuit breaker cap in this case is going to be 2,900 because we are multiplying each type of gross assessed value times its individual cap and then summing them and then summing all three together. So we can still calculate by hand uh, the circuit breaker cap on a multi-use parcel. It just takes that additional step to figure out what type of property we're looking at, multiplying by the cap, and then summing uh, summing all three of those together. Now, the third one is third one's a big one, and we can look at the same question from three different perspectives. First perspective is my school system, my school corporation just passed an operating or a capital or a school safety referendum. How will this impact my tax bill? Or Another way we can look at it is using all the information that we covered throughout this presentation, I'm trying to calculate my circuit breaker cap and it's higher than just one or two or 3% of my gross AV. Third way of asking the same question is, 
what does it mean for a fund to be exempt from circuit breaker? Now, when, when we look at table two here, the, the second line is listed as an upward adjustment due to voter approved projects or charges, e.g. referendum. When a community, when there is a voter approved referendum, that referendum is not subject to circuit breakers. What we are looking at is a, when there is a voter approved referendum, we will be increasing the circuit breaker cap for an individual for an individual taxpayer. So if you vote for it, you have to pay for it, which means that there are situations where an individual at their property tax cap with a voter approved referendum will see their cap increase so that they can pay for the referendum that has been approved. There's another way of looking at this. There's another way of looking at this. And so on the next two slides, we're going to take a look at the same rate increase. In this example, we're looking at the rate increasing from 4.5 to 4.75. And this is just a traditional rate increase. There is no referendum that's sort of associated with it. Now, in our example, the property, the gross liability exceeds the property tax cap. And so while the rate went from 4.5 to 4.75, the property tax cap did not change. And so in year one, we see a $474 worth of circuit breaker credit. And in year two, we're looking at a $556 worth of circuit breaker credit. Now in this next example, what we're looking at is the same rate increase, but this time it's due to a voter approved referendum. So the rate still went from 4.5 to 4.75. The gross liability still went from 1474 to 1556. But in the in the blue line, we can see that the circuit breaker cap has switched from 1000 to 1082. So how did how did we calculate that that new property tax cap? Well, if the voter approved referendum was 25 cents and the net assessed value was the 32,750, that 25 cent rate would generate an $82 increase in the in the in the bill itself. So we increased the cap, so it includes that additional $82, $82. And we can see that with a voter approved referendum, the circuit breaker loss hasn't changed. The property tax bill that the unit, that this uh, individual is gonna pay, went from a cap of 1,000 to a cap of 1,082. So in this example, both the bill went up and the cap went up. And so when we're talking about voter approved referendums, if we're ever dealing with a situation with a taxpayer who says, well, 1% of my gross AV or 2% or 3% is this one, but my bill is higher than that, the likely culprit is that there is a voter approved referendum that increased that circuit breaker cap. So for that individual who found themselves in the cap of the prior year, not only is their bill going to go up, but their cap's going to go up. The, they effectively have to pay for the referendum that was approved by the voters. So home stretch, we're just into the, the, the last two slides here. And so the first one is, this is, like I said, this is one of the more complex presentations that the department gives all year. We started off with just some really basic information about what's on the budget order, but then quickly as we started getting into the tax bills, as we started getting into the, these concepts of circuit breakers, we can see how this gets complicated in a hurry. Uh, hopefully this reinforced why the department or why the budget division specifically is interested in how circuit breaker is used to how the estimate of circuit breaker is used to create a budget and then uh, selling you on the idea of once the actual circuit breaker numbers are available reviewing the estimates compared to the actuals to confirm that our budgets are remain fundable and that our spending priorities that were uh, established last year can still be funded by the existing resources. Now, this uh, should not be your only conversation about circuit breaker. We've got a, the entirety of the field rep staff is either going to attend the same present, either is in attendance now or will be attending this presentation this afternoon. They understand the, the way that circuit breaks are looking. They can assist you in uh, finding what you estimated last year in reviewing the reports that we're going to be posting online to make those comparisons that we've talked about. 
The department also encourages you to uh, take a look at your circuit breakers this year. Take a look at your circuit breakers from last year as you are working through your upcoming budget cycle. If the if you can come up with a, an, an, an estimate that you would prefer to use instead of the, the estimate that the department is putting together uh, here in the next week or so, you will have both the current year's amount of circuit breaker on our website. You can find prior years so that we can, so that as you're putting together your budget, you can come up with an estimate or try to come up with an estimate that's going to accurately reflect the amount of circuit breaker that will ultimately be, uh, uh, the amount of circuit breaker that will not be collected by your, by your unit. Okay, I see that we are just about out of time here. I think we're going to leave the the, the Q and A session open. If you've got questions, we will collect the questions from this morning session. We will collect this, the questions from the afternoon section, and we'll put out an FAQ to go along with uh, when Jenny sends out the sends out the slides. When she sends out the info, we'll address any questions that uh, that you may drop into the Q and A. We'll include answers to, to to each of those questions as well. Otherwise, you're, you would, would encourage you to uh, direct your questions to your field representatives about where your circuit breaker profile is, any questions you have about the presentation, they can, uh, they can help you work through those as well. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. We hope this has been a useful overview of what circuit breakers are, how they, what circuit breakers are, what they mean, and the, the impact they have on your budget. We'll hope to see you at the next presentation that the department does. Thank you and have a good day.